Hello and welcome to Mrs. Long's video lesson on the picture of Dorian Gray. Today we're looking at chapter 18. So chapter 18 is the following day after Dorian falls down in a faint in the conservatory after seeing the face of James Vane in the mirror. And so we encounter Dorian in the throes of absolute anxiety and paranoia at the beginning of this chapter. So he doesn't leave his room all of the next day, and it says he spends his time sick with a wild terror of dying and yet indifferent to life itself. And every time he closed his eyes, he saw again the sailor's face peering through the mist stained glass, and horror seemed once more to lay its hand upon his heart. So what we have here is Dorian, who is completely uh, sort of confused, afraid, obsessed with the idea of his own impending death. He says, <clears throat> in the common world of fact, of fact, the wicked were not punished nor the good rewarded. Success was given to the strong, failure thrust upon the weak, that was all. Besides, had any stranger been prowling around the house, he would have been seen by servants or keepers. So he's trying to convince himself that it was merely his fancy, as it said. Sybil Vane, brother... Civil Vane's brother had not come back to kill him. The man did not know who he was, could not know who he was, because the mask of youth had saved him. So he's trying to rationalize his feelings and make himself feel better. Of course, there's lovely dramatic irony there, because we know now at the, at the end of that chapter when he escaped James Vane, that the woman came back and told um, James who Dorian actually was the fact that he had been preserved. Um, and so Dorian thinks the mask of his youth has saved him. But it can't. He, even though he logically tells himself that it can't be James Vane, he still is um, haunted. And he even thinks to himself, what sort of life would be his if day and night shadows of his crime were to peer at him from silent cor corners, mock him from secret places, whisper in his ear as he sat at the feast to wake him with icy fingers as he lay asleep. And he ruse the day in what a wild hour of madness had he killed his friend. And when Lord Henry comes in to um, see him at six o'clock, he finds Dorian Gray crying as one whose heart will break. Interesting here how he is sorry that he killed Basil because it's haunting him. So Dorian's distress is not a result of his guilt, it's a result of his fear of being found out. There is a difference. And it is not till the third day after his initial fainting spell that he is brave enough to go out. And it says that his own nature had revolted against the excess of anguish that had sought to maim and mar the perfection of his calm. And so he sort of rallies himself and um, has convinced himself that he was just the victim of a terror-stricken imagination and looked back now in his fear with something of pity and not a little of contempt. So time passed, he reconciled um, what had happened, blamed it on his imagination and seems to be feeling better. So he goes out for a walk but, and encounters a group of men who are, of his party who are hunting. Sir Geoffrey, who is the Duchess's brother, um, is about to shoot um, a, a rabbit, the hare, sorry, that's jumped out of uh, the brush. And in a moment of sort of strange clarity, Dorian says, it says something in the animal's grace um, charmed him and he cried out, don't shoot at Geoffrey, let it live. And of course, his companion responds by saying, that's nonsense. And um, he shoots anyway. But then they hear two cries, the cry of a hare in pain and the cry of a man in agony. And so Geoffrey exclaims that, he, good heavens, I've hit a beater. What an ass the man was to get in front of the guns. And he moans at Dorian, why don't you keep your men back? You've spoiled my shooting for the day. Now, 
it's, it's, I want to say interesting, but it's not interesting. It's disgusting, really, how the people of Dorian's class view people who are lower than them. So Beta would have been a man employed to walk through um, the undergrowth and disturb any animals, hares, birds that were in there so that the hunting party could shoot them. So this is a man who is very far below their station. And Sir Geoffrey has now killed somebody. He's shot this man. And his first response is that he was stupid to get in front of the guns. And oh, now he's spoiled my shooting for the day. No regard for the human life of this person. And in the, in the next scene, the body gets dragged out and Dorian turns away in horror. It seemed to him that misfortune followed wherever he went. Now, Dorian sees this as a sign. And when Lord Henry says to Dorian, we better stop shooting for the day, it would not look well to go on. In other words, they're not stopping because they're upset that somebody's died. It just wouldn't be a good, the optics of it aren't good. Okay. And Dorian says, I wish it were stopped forever. The whole thing is hideous and cruel. Now, this is not something that Dorian would normally have thought. You can imagine that hunting would just be something that they did on um, a daily basis to amuse themselves. But it's because he sees this as a bad omen. And um, Lord Henry can't really understand this sort of out of character response of Dorian. And he says, it can't be helped. It was the man's own fault. He got in front of the guns. Besides, it's nothing to us. So he also takes on the character of his class and doesn't think that it's anything to do with them. He's not concerned. He just says, though, it is rather awkward for Jeffrey because people will think that he's a bad shot. So again, completely disgustingly superficial response. Um, it's only in the way that it concerns them that it's negative. They're not at all thinking about this, the, this loss of human life. Dorian says, I feel as if something terrible were going to happen to some of us, to myself, perhaps. And Lord Henry typically, even when Dorian is trying to discuss something quite serious with him, he says, Ugh, the only horrible thing in the world is ennui, Dorian. There's no such thing as an omen. Now, ennui is something that people of Dorian's class think are quite familiar with. It's a sense of dissatisfaction and boredom um, from a life that is sort of lacking in meaningful employment. Besides, says Lord Henry, what on earth could happen to you? You have everything in the world that a man can want. And of course, from the outside, that indeed seems true. The whole idea of appearances versus reality comes up again here. Dorian says, there's no one with whom I could not change places. I have no terror of death. It's the coming of death that terrifies me. Good heavens, do you see the man moving behind the trees there, watching me, waiting for me? So his paranoia has returned on this incident of this man being killed because he sees it as some sort of reflection of his own death. And he's not so much scared of dying, but it's the coming of death and his sort of the growing sense of fear and that something is haunting him that is following Dorian like the shadow. As they're walking back towards the house, a servant brings um, a letter from the Duchess. And it's noted that women are fond of doing dangerous things. A woman will flirt with anybody in the world as long as other people are looking on. And uh, Dorian says, you're fond of saying dangerous things. In the present instance, you're quite astray. I like the Duchess, but I don't love her. So the flirtation, as probably with most of uh, Dorian's interactions is fairly surf on the surface and Lord Henry says well the Duchess loves you but she likes she doesn't like you so much so that's a good match and um, after a little bit more chat Dorian says that Harry would sacrifice anybody for the sake of an epigram in other words you don't really care about people's feelings as long as it feeds into you being able to say something witty about the nature of human um, interactions which of course we know to be true lord henry feels very has very little ability for empathy but rather observes people's um, joys and sorrows as a scientific experiment more than anything else right so 
this then the, the evening of this the, this fatal day for the poor man who was shot in the bushes Dorian decides that he cannot stay there any anymore and he wants to send um, a wire to one of his people his servants to have the yacht got ready on a yacht one is safe interesting that he thinks he's going to be safe on a yacht and the person he's running from is a sailor I like that little bit of um, irony there safe from what Dorian says Lord Henry you're in some trouble why not tell me what it is you know I would help you I can't tell you Harry he answered sadly I have a horrible presentiment that something of the kind may happen to me now, interesting that he can't feel that like he can confide in Harry it speaks to the strangeness of their friendship and it reminds us of uh, what Dorian said to Basil that he didn't feel like he if he was in trouble he could go to Henry he would rather go to Basil of course he's now robbed himself of that opportunity um, and so he doesn't actually confide in Henry and he says I dare say it's only a fancy of mine it's just this accident that's upset me and tries to explain it away um, Lord Henry then mentions the fact that it's curious that Dorian asked Geoffrey not to shoot the hare just as um, he was about to take the shot which killed the beater and he remarks that he's sorry the Duchess has found out about the dead man because it's a hideous subject uh, they liked to uh, shelter women from unpleasant occurrences Henry says, well, if Jeffrey had done the thing on purpose, that would be interesting. I should like to know someone who has committed a real murder. And, of course, at this this comment, Dorian pales again. And he says, oh, uh, um, the, the Duchess says, Mr. Gray is ill again. He's going to faint. Now, of course, it's because <laughs> obviously Hen Henry does know somebody who has committed a real murder, um, but doesn't know it. Upstairs in his room, Dorian is lying on the sofa with every the terror and every tingling fiber on in his body. Um, and he it says he'd nearly swooned at what Lord Henry had said in a chance mood of cynical jesting. So he cannot get rid of this awful um, idea of this dead man and what it means for him. It's brought all of his fear and, and paranoia up again and what Lord Henry said really just like hit to the heart of his concern and so it says he's determined not to spend another night there because it is an ill omen place and death walks in sunlight now again Dorian makes a miraculous escape at the end of this chapter because when his servant comes in to give him information about the dead man Dorian sort of does his duty I don't think it's out of any sense of of empathy it's just the done thing he offers assistance to the man's family and they say no so we've actually never seen him before he seems like a sailor and of course at that moment Dorian drops his pen and he jumps to his feet with a terrible hope he thinks this could be my saving grace and he rushes to the barn where they are keeping the body and just as he's about to uncover uh, or walk in for them to uncover the 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 corpse it's, he says he pauses for a moment feeling he's on the brink of a discovery that either make or mar his life in other words if that if it is um james vane he is going to be able to live a charmed life again if it isn't it's going to mar him and his life will be ruined again or on a path of ruin and so when he sees the face of the man a cry of joy broke from his lips now can you imagine and he he rides home his eyes full of tears for he knew that he was safe and so the incredible sense of disgust from our point anyway at Dorian's behavior because he is now just so completely um, overjoyed that it's James Vane who was dead. Why? Because it's more 
human life to him is not as important as his, or any human life is not as important as his own. And so he feels that he is now safe and um, it doesn't matter who is in fact dead as long as he isn't.